Hello and welcome to episode number three of the Uncle Skelly Show. This week, I interviewed bass player and Rock and Roll Hall of Fame inductee Dennis Dunaway. Dennis, as you may know, played bass in the Alice Cooper group from 1968 to 1974, having co-written some of his biggest hits, including I'm 18 and Under My Wheels. Dennis's new memoir, Snakes, Guillotines, Electric Chairs, candidly describes his journey in the Alice Cooper group from the uprising to the heyday to the dissolving of the band. So have a seat, listen in, and love it to death. Yeah, I was reading most of the reviews and everyone kind of thought the same thing I did. I, about time there's a biography that details, you know, this era of the band. Yes, I intended for it to come out uh, quite a few years ago. It took me 18 years from the time I started writing it until it actually came out. I, I thought it might have had something to do with, you know, the uh, Rock Hall induction and then the documentary there, that Super Duper Alice Cooper. Uh, this book here... Snakes, guillotines, electric chairs seem to be a, a companion piece to that documentary. Yes, well, the lengthy amount of time it took me to land the correct um, publishing deal turned out to be kind of a blessing in disguise because everything fell into place just right once it started uh, going my way. I was kind of like when I was reading the book, it was kind of, it's kind of nice, it was kind of refreshing almost that, you know, you didn't tear anybody apart, you were just kind of kind of gently going through things the way you saw them, you know, uh, about Alice and, uh, you know, Glenn and all the drinking and everything. You you know, you weren't, uh, you were kind of upset with Alice, it seemed like, you know, near the end, you know, when he was going into the nightmare, welcome to my nightmare, but you kind of, I don't know. Yeah, you, you don't harness any uh, ill will or anything. You guys are all good friends now, and it seems like, so... Yeah, well, Alice and I have known each other since we were 16 years old, and the band has always been friends. It seems like uh, it's kind of ironic because a lot of the fans seem to be more uh, sort of at, at odds with each other between the original group camp and the solo Alice camp. Uh, but the band has been friends all along. So, <clears throat> you know, there's been uh, certainly some hardships to overcome to maintain friendships but uh we're family you know and that's what you do when you when you're a family now was it um it wasn't really detailed in the book but i like uh through the years i know you kind of you kept in touch with him a little bit like in the late 70s early 80s there but then after that like by the time he started doing the constrictor and his uh you know his resurgence was there any kind of um maybe hint at doing a reunion with them there or well a reunion has always been up to uh alice and his manager because uh the band never left and we've all we're all just a phone call away we always have been we never we never intended not to be in the show yeah because i know so, you yeah yeah so that's all it would take uh, we thought it was going to happen in 2011. Alice started uh, announcing in interviews that the original band was going to do a five-city tour. And we were all excited, and we did rehearsals, and Alice was very excited. And then all of a sudden, uh, and for unknown reasons to me, all of a sudden it just disappeared overnight. I, it seems like, yeah, the closest it's been is on that Welcome to My Nightmare, the, the two, the, well, the sequel there, the album. He had you and uh, Neil and Michael on a few tracks. And yeah, we did three songs in two days. Uh, Neil wrote one, and Michael wrote one, and I wrote one. And then Alice and Bob Ezrin uh, gave them all their uh, input. And uh, it was a heck of a lot of fun. I mean, we we were in uh, New York City recording, and uh, Alice was there, uh, and Bob Essern was there. And uh, I really liked the, the feel of the sessions because uh, everybody was willing to try everybody's ideas. And also, there was a lot of joking around, just like the, the good old days. Yeah, I noticed you're also, too, on the the Hollywood Vampires album. You're on a couple of tracks on that one? On one track. Well, it's one song that's actually two songs, School's Out and Another Brick in the Wall. 
Uh, Neil Smith and I uh, worked on that in New York City as well with Bob Ezrin. Uh, the other musicians on the track are Brian Johnson, ACDC, of course, uh, Joe Perry, Slash, Johnny Depp. Yeah, but back to the book, I was kind of, uh, it was kind of neat, like you guys ran into a lot of people on the way up, like Frank Zappa, uh, Sid Barrett, uh, even partied with the Doors a little bit. You're talking about that in your uh, LSD, I think, in your little LSD endeavors there in the late 60s. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Mid-60s, sort of. <laughs> Mid to late. It's all a blur, eh? <laughs> uh, yeah, well, that was Los Angeles for you, and... Uh, you know, there was all kinds of things going on on the Sunset Strip, and uh, there was a lot of experimentation going on, and uh, uh, it was uh, more of an innocent era in that it was before you started hearing about, you know, drug casualties. So, uh, you know, it kind of went with the free love, love in, everything's groovy and peace, and everything, and then uh, came along the Charles Manson era, which everything got much darker and changed in Los Angeles. Uh, there was a point there where the, with the Vietnam War happening and all of a sudden things got more uh, a line drawn in the sand between the establishment and the, the hippies who were out to make it a better world and were, were interested in changing things. And, and, uh, but, but all of a sudden drugs became bigger and bigger and then you started to see people dying and uh uh and all of a sudden they traded in their ideals for you know their next fix so that's about the time that the alice cooper group were coming up and bands that were doing darker music were uh suddenly uh appropriate for what was going on even though a lot of the hippie movement didn't want to admit it they were uh, burning themselves out. Uh, but, you know, we always thought that we reflected society. So 
when the Alice Cooper group were in Arizona, you know, we, we, uh, did certain things that, um, went on that reflected what was going on in the Southwest. And then when we got to LA, we got all glitzed out and everything. And, and we looked at it like we were reflecting the, the Hollywood, uh, glamour and the, you know, even the, the chintzy side of it. Uh, but we were so, uh, you know, bands didn't do anything androgynous then. I mean, Liberace wore pretty flamboyant outfits and little Richard, of course, but, and even the, the cowboy, uh, singers, you know, Buck Owens, everybody had to have those, uh, nudie rodeo suits. It was actually a, uh, that's how you let people know that you finally made it when you could afford one of those suits with all of the bangles on it. Uh, but nobody had done it in an androgynous way like we did. And even though, you had five straight guys, which makes it even more amazing that <laughs> we were able to talk everybody into uh, kind of putting our lives on the line uh, in order to do that. Uh, we were basically looked at it like we were reflecting Hollywood. Then when we got to Detroit, then all of a sudden here's all of these people, their fists in the air. You know, if you did a ballad, uh, that meant it's time for the audience to go to the bathroom, you know. And, and if you were still doing a ballad, when they came out of the bathroom, they'd run you out of town with a tire irons. So we all of a sudden took on that edge. And the Motor City Bad Boys Club took us under their wing, and, and they started glamming out. Then next thing you know, the MC5 were wearing shiny fabrics, and Iggy Pop was wearing silver lame gloves so so art uh influences art that way which i think is good what did we get from them we got an edgier uh heavier sound and a heavier image uh in order to be uh accepted by those audiences i always think like you know, people say the Stooges kind of created the punk sound and then the Black Sabbath created the, the, the metal sound. I always think that Alice Cooper was kind of a bridging of both, you know, especially when it came to the Love It to Death album. Because before that, music was a bit different for Alice Cooper. It was more a little more psychedelia, a little more uh, abstract, kind of weird, kind of art rock, I guess you could say. Yes, well, we were very avant-garde on our first album. And... uh I think had we not gone there originally, uh, we wouldn't have had all of the uh, drive to keep being different on our later, more relatable image. Uh, but uh, I do think the Stooges were the original punks. The only band I can think of that would sort of precede them would be the Seeds, who were really a garage band, but they were pretty punky and they were out of LA with uh, songs like pushing too hard. And, uh, so yeah, we picked up on that because we had to follow the stooges, you know, what do you, how do you do that? Uh, well, that's when we decided that we would execute our singer. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we ship, we would shift gears and go darker. Now, as far as metal, we never really played metal. I think the closest thing was maybe black juju, but, uh, but we had, I think, uh, an image that influenced the metal bands. Dude, like shock rock, that's a term that gets thrown around a lot. Do you remember how that started? Like, you had, No, you ever... it was just, I mean, they were trying to find a way to describe us, you know, and so we had uh, glitter rock, glam rock, theatric rock, theatrical rock, and then shock rock was another one, and... Uh, I kind of like shock rock the best because it really, uh, we did go for shock value all along. Uh, we wanted to incorporate the audience into the show, which I don't think many bands had done, at least not in the way that we did. That's where we came up with the giant weather balloons. Uh, the original balloons that we used were actually weather balloons. You, they would uh, let them go way up in the sky and they would 
be able to uh, determine what the weather was going to be. Uh, so we got a hold of a bunch of those, and we would fill them up with confetti and uh, smoke. There would be smoke inside of it, so when it popped, uh, you'd see a big puff of smoke. And we would actually put real money inside of them. Uh, so uh, uh, the idea was to break down the barrier between the entertainer and the audience. So we would toss these giant balloons out. We would blow feathers out. Uh, we would have shiny fabrics with really bright photo flash floods uh, to reflect it so brightly that uh, we did one show in Detroit where we got uh, corrugated aluminum, and that was the backdrop, the curtain behind the band. So it was really shiny, brand new. And we had shiny garbage cans, and we wore all chrome jumpsuits. And I had mirrors on my bass, and Neil had mirrors on his drums. And, uh, and, the, and then during one part of the show where everything started happening, the big climax uh, these bright lights went on that made it the the concept was to make it so bright that the audience couldn't look at it, but they had to kind of like, you know, looking at a solar eclipse or something without yeah. glasses. <laughs> uh, so uh, that also had to do with reflecting society, but it also had to do with breaking down the barrier between, uh, you know, including the audience into the show because uh, we would have smoke in the room, so you would see all of these rays of light uh, coming off of the stage. So um, these were just artistic concepts that uh, Alice and I, when we were in high school, 16 years old, uh, probably around the age of 17 is when we actually decided we were going to uh, incorporate artistic ideas into a rock band. And all of these things that led up to these bigger and bigger uh, concepts were basically just that, putting adding art to a rock band. Uh, speaking of the whole, yeah, the uh, including the audience and the performance was the, uh, yeah, I liked how you dispelled some of the myths too uh, with the, uh, the chicken incident. And that was, yeah, because I was always led to believe that he didn't, re I don't know, he threw it back in the crowd like he... Uh, like it was a surprise to him. I didn't know that was actual supposed to be part of the show. Well, it was part of the show, but uh, the reason that we uh, started coming up with the disclaimer is because after that, uh, every time we would show up at a venue, there would be the Humane Society and the you know animal rights people and fire marshals and everybody in the world was there to with reasons that we shouldn't perform. So. Uh, so, and I, we thought, well, if we admit that that was part of the show, an intentional part of the show, it would make it tougher. Uh, and it was plenty tough even with us trying to wiggle our way out of it. But then, it, you know, you say something like that and next thing you know, it gets etched into stone. And I, I didn't, didn't set out in my book to, uh, dispel legends and everything basically all i wanted to do is just tell the story the way i remember it that's all
the Ouija board, I think, was basically a gimmick that uh, a friend of ours, Dick Christian, and Vince uh, decided to use because it was like the following night after uh, Alice thought of the name Alice Cooper, uh, and the band wasn't quite going for it. We weren't sure. We were already getting chased out of town by cowboys. So, uh, but I went home to my parents' house, and when I saw the look on their face when I told them that was going to be our name, uh, then that convinced me that, that we had to do it because they were shocked. <laughs> and so the next night, now Alice has me on his side, and I was relentless when I got uh, behind an idea. And uh, I think the Ouija board was mostly just a gimmick that Alice and this friend of ours, Dick Christian, came up with to kind of uh, put the, uh, you know, the icing on the cake for selling the idea. Seemed to be the thing was like there's so many there were so many rumors stories about you guys it just seemed like that that was a thing to do just run with it right every time someone came up with something you know you guys someone had some you know weird rumor about you you just kind of go with it. Well, uh, we always spread rumors about the band. Um, Alice and I were on the high school newspaper, and when we were the Earwigs, which was our first uh, uh, Beatles spoof band. Uh, we would think of all these ideas that would get us into the high school newspaper. So we were always exaggerating, you know, the truth in order to make an interesting story. And uh, Alice also always had this idea in his head that, uh, you know, somebody start who starts a uh, faddish phrase that, that sweeps the country and all of a sudden everybody says, oh, that that car is bitching or hey, that's Cherry or whatever, you know, all these sayings. And Alice always fancied himself as starting a uh, saying like that. And one of the ones that, uh, that he had come up with was Love It to Death. Well, we named the album that, and it's sort of, you know, we do still hear uh, fans say Love It to Death, which means they really like something. Uh, but we would spread rumors when we were the spiders, and we would spread rumors when we became Alice Cooper, uh, mainly Alice just uh, in every day talking to people, he's very congenial, you know, as people know, they can tell from seeing his interviews. Uh, he would always be able to enhance stories. I mean, I used to say he could make uh, opening a can of tuna fish interesting. <laughs> so, so we just had that in us. And I used to always say my, my thing that I would say whenever, you know, usually with five guys, there would be a day when I would be down or Neil would be down or somebody would be down. But we'd always have somebody that was up to kind of, you know, give them a little pep talk or whatever. And my pep talk was always, you know, the smaller the crowd, the bigger the rumors. Yeah, well, yeah, once, uh, yeah, you start with one story, once it goes around, it turns into something else, you know. Uh, well, whole... especially in the early uh, days when we were doing all of the avant-garde stuff, because people would, we would deliver it with such a serious attitude that people uh, felt that there had to be a message. There had to be a reason that Alice was stabbing the watermelon with an umbrella that had rats hanging off of it. Uh, now, if we were all smiling and, and stuff, it would have just come off a shtick. But, but we delivered it. Everybody was always in this dead serious, uh, you know, it was an artistic uh, statement like the Dada artist. And people would string all of these things. We might do like 20 things in a show. And they were unrelated, most of them. Uh, but people would think, well, that has to mean something. So, uh, so that was another way to start rumors. People would go and tell their friends, oh, this band does all of these theatrical things that, that has a hidden message that you have to figure out. So people would come and to our shows and then they'd come backstage and, you know, the show kept evolving so it would be different. So they'd come backstage and, explain to us what our sh what that show meant and if we told them well you know okay yeah yeah that's you got it you know <laughs> but it didn't really mean anything yeah let's get back to uh you're currently in a band blue coop 
with uh, two members from Blue Oyster Cult. Yes, uh, Joe and Albert Bouchard. Uh, Albert played drums with the Blue Oyster Cult, and Joe, who was actually a guitar player, uh, who they, uh, Blue Oyster Cult needed a bass player one night, and like Joe Bouchard puts it, and so he said, okay, yeah, I'll play bass for you. And next thing you know, he said 16 years later, he went back to guitar. <laughs> uh, but Joe plays guitar with Blue Coop, and, and we all sing. So it's like a, a hard rock trio with lots of harmonies. Uh, we also have uh, singers, uh, Tish and Snooky of Manic Panic. Uh, they do the hair dye that's world famous. And they also sang with the, the the early version of Blondie before they decided that okay. that they wanted to focus on one girl rather than three. Uh, and uh, they're iconic in New York City. But we've done two albums. Blue Coop are very prolific. Uh, Joe and Albert are both music teachers, and and whenever you ask them what they're up to, you get tired just listening to all of the things that they're able to achieve in, in um, one month. Uh, but we have a lot of fun with it. We met in 1972 when uh, Blue Oyster Cult uh, opened for Alice on, during the Billion Dollar Babies Tour. So uh, we've been friends ever since. Uh, we have two albums, Tornado on the Tracks, which has an exceptionally incredible song, I think. Well, it's, it seems to be universally popular with our fans. It's called You Like Vampires. I was just listening to that. Yes, that's a very good tune. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, that's written by John Cook, who is a neighbor uh, on the St. Lawrence River in upstate New York who lived right next door to where Joe and Albert grew up as little kids. Uh, so... Uh, our our next album was uh, Million Miles More, which Jack Douglas uh, is in on the production. Warren Hewitt of The Fray uh, mixed it. And uh, Alice sings on it. Buck Dharma plays guitar on it. Uh, Goldie McJohn from Steppenwolf plays keyboards on it. And uh, we have a lot of guests on our albums, but we still manage to maintain our own sound, which is... It sounds like uh, most people describe it as a classic rock band with a new twist. So we like that. We uh, Most of our songs sound, especially on Million Miles More album, sound very live. And we also wrote those songs to be uh, relatable uh, we wanted people to be able to be singing along with the choruses halfway through the song. We wanted them to be that, seem to be that familiar. And I think we did a really good job. We worked very hard to achieve that. Uh, you guys are, you, you guys play shows? Uh, you're on tour right now or just do a sporadic shows? Actually, we've got a break right now, but we've played all kinds of uh, opera houses in Corsica and upstate New York. We played Lincoln Center. We played the New York City Halloween Parade. Uh, we're, we're very active, but uh, in October, we will be playing up in Buffalo, uh, October 2nd and 3rd. October 4th, we'll be in Hamilton, Ontario, outside of Toronto. And then uh, I'll be in Dallas, Oklahoma City. And then Blue Coop will meet up with me in Nashville, all of our dates are easy to find. Uh, you can look up DennisDunaway.com, Dennis Dunaway Facebook, Blue Coop Band Facebook, Blue Coop Band website, Joe or Albert Bouchard. We're easily accessible, and all of our uh, endeavors are posted. You're also doing a, uh, a, a, book tour, a book signing tour, right? You and Neil and Michael Bruce. Uh, we're all going to be in Dallas Texas on October 6th and Alice will be in town. So I'm Great. sure the, the old gang will have some partying to do. <laughs> There's a thing uh, with um, the whole reunion thing though. Uh, wouldn't it like say it's up to Alice's management. I mean, wouldn't that be good for, you know, I'm sure if 
that would draw a lot of people in. I was in the band in 1975, and then something happened beyond my control. And, uh, and here I am all these years later, and not a day has gone by which several, without several people asking me about a reunion. Well, it's not up to me. <laughs> I'm ready. Yes, I'm yeah. for it. I have been all along. I never wanted to leave. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, there's other people standing in my place on stage. Uh, I did join Alice uh, a couple weeks ago uh, for School South, another brick in the wall on stage uh, in Connecticut. Uh, he was opening for Motley Crue that night. Yes. Yeah. And we had a lot of fun. You know, we're, we're good friends. Uh, Alice's wife, Cheryl, and my wife, Cindy, are good friends, and, and I like all of the band members. They're all really cool people and very uh, high-caliber, talented musicians. So, uh, you know, it was our anniversary. Cindy and I had been married 41 years celebrating uh, that on that night, and uh, Cheryl invited Cindy to, to join her on stage as one of the mean nurses uh, Cindy was the original mean nurse, and uh, now Cheryl uh, does it in the show. But uh, Cindy declined. She was just imagining herself tripping over a guitar cable while, uh, while Cheryl, who is a, an amazing dancer, is doing these high kicks and stiletto heels. <laughs> uh, I, I didn't bother to inform Cindy that the bands don't use guitar cables anymore. <laughs> Uh oh! Can you hear the phone ringing on Phones, here? The telephone is ringing. <laughs> okay, well, got me on the run. 